you want to take your Bible, tonight, we're going to go to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, we continue our study. Uh, we started a few weeks back, it kind of comes out of our study. We started maybe three or four weeks back, but uh, continue now looking at this idea of sanctification and the changing of the Christian as we're saved. And we begin this process of sanctification. The Lord begins this work in us uh, that He says He will complete. And so tonight we get to the person of change. We looked at uh, Romans chapter 12, verse number 2, a couple weeks ago, and we said this renewing of our mind. Uh, Paul tells us that we would not be conformed to the world, that we wouldn't allow the world to put us in a box, or that we wouldn't allow culture around us to put us, uh, to squeeze us into the mold that the world wants us to be in, that we would uh, allow our minds to be renewed through the scriptures and change that way of thinking. Uh, and many times that is complete opposite to the way of the world. And then we looked last week. At Philippians 2 and verse number 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And so as our mind is renewed through the scriptures, we really take on the mind of Christ. And it's a mind of humility. It's a mind of, of a servant that would be a servant of God uh, and ultimately would cause us to be a servant of man. And so tonight, and in, the, in a good sense, not that we would just be men pleasers or men servants, but that we would be servants in the eyes of God uh, and would be willing to be servants to others. And so tonight we want to come to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to pick up, uh, starting in verse number 1, but we're going to come out of verse number uh, 14 tonight, uh, as being led by the Spirit of God. And so as we begin uh, this third part of this, the person of change is going to be the Holy Spirit tonight. Notice in Romans 8, and verse number 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be, that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the Son of God. And so we want to look tonight at, at the person of change, the Holy Spirit. And Paul's talking here about being led by the Spirit of God. And so we can uh, really just read this chapter and pull out the truths that he's talking about, being led by the Spirit, having the Spirit of God dwell in us. And we ought to be pursuing that. So we'll look at that truth tonight. Uh, and we'll pull from some of these verses, and, and we'll try to move through this uh, rather quickly tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to spend time in prayer. And Lord, I know that it's an important time in our church. Uh, I know many churches tonight would pass over the, the time of prayer, and maybe one person would pray, or we'd pray quickly. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would uh, take seriously the opportunity that we have to pray, but also an opportunity now to be in the Word of God and have the Holy Spirit teach us something tonight. I pray, Lord, that you help me to be sustained, sustained and to say what needs to be said, not to talk too much. Lord, help us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so notice as we come out of Romans 12, 2, where our, we're not conformed to the world, but we're transformed by that renewing of our mind. As we get into the Word of God and as we're studying the Word of God, uh, we begin to learn the mind of Christ. And then Philippians 2 tells us to take on that mind of Christ that we would be like him and we would have that mind that is a mind of humility. And so now we come into Romans chapter 8, verse number 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And so in this process of sanctification, it comes through the renewing of the believer's mind through the Scriptures. 
And that renewing comes by taking on the mind of Christ. But as we do, who's responsible for that change? Well, I believe both of us are. The Holy Spirit ultimately is going to do that changing. But I need to be spending time in the Word of God. I need to be yielding to the Holy Spirit. But He ultimately is going to be doing that change and leading me through that change. And so you might look at it as a father-son relationship. My son wants to learn things. He wants to get better at things. But he needs a teacher that will go side by side or take him by the hand and lead him through life so that he can learn those lessons in a protect, protected and in a right environment. And so the Holy Spirit allows me to just take him by the hand and walk through life with him. And he begins to teach me. He puts me in situations where I can learn things. But he's always there with me and he's moving me in a direction where I can learn from those things. And I can succeed in that. I can pass the test because I have the scriptures. I have the mind of God in black and white for me in my own language. And I can study and get to know it. And as I yield to the Holy Spirit, He's going to lead and direct me. And so sometimes in our lives of our kids, they, they yield to our will. They yield to what we want. And other times we've got to bend their will to get them to yield to us. And we've got to uh, do things that maybe we don't like to do to get them to see our point of view. And so the Holy Spirit knows those things. And sometimes we conform to His will. Sometimes we're ready to follow. And other times He's got to bring things in our lives that will conform our will to His. And so He says here, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. So, uh, not really a point tonight. But before we go any further, stop and think about it. Are you being led by the Holy Spirit tonight? Are there times in your life when you just feel the slap of the Holy Spirit saying you shouldn't be doing that? Or you feel the confirmation of the Holy Spirit saying, all right, you're doing well. This is where I want you to go. Maybe you've read your scripture this morning, you were in the Bible, and you just, you're in tune with God, and you know, you confirm that the Spirit is there. And he says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And if the Spirit of God is not active in your life, if you haven't had contact with Him, you need to wonder if you're saved or not. The Bible would teach that the Holy Spirit is that person of change. The Holy Spirit is not some mystical, impersonal influence. It's not like, you know, the world will be celebrating tomorrow and uh, have been now this last month for some ghost and some mystical thing that's out there. You know, some of the charismatics and Pentecostals that get all goofed up in this mystical thing of it. Uh, he's not a mystical thing. He's not some force that's out there. He is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity. Amen. He is part of the Godhead. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so it's that third person of the Trinity that is interacting with you and I. And he interacts with us through the Word of God. And as we read the Bible, as we read the Word of God, the Holy Spirit uses it in our lives to teach us and to move us in the direction he wants us to go. So it is the Holy Spirit that shows us our need of Christ, and He begins to import, uh, impart the life of Christ to us at salvation. And again, it's that process that, you know, when we break it down in our minds and we say, well, I come to know Christ as my Savior, and I'm saved immediately, and the Holy Spirit indwells me immediately, and there's a lot that's happening right there. Uh, I'm now justified in the eyes of God. Romans 8, 1 says, now there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ. I'm made at peace with God. There's a lot of things that are happening at that moment of salvation. And I begin this process of sanctification. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts me of my sin and shows me my need of a Savior and begins this new walk with Christ at the moment of salvation. He then begins the work of changing my life to become more like Christ through sanctification. As I spend time in the Word of God, as I spend time under preaching and teaching, as I'm spending time around my fellow believers, as I get into the Bible and I just uh, pour myself into it and allow it to begin to change me, it's the Holy Spirit, as I yield to His leading, that begins moving me further and further, or we might say maturing me in this process of sanctification. So it's the Holy Spirit also that empowers us for service, then as we seek to serve Christ and live out the will of God for our lives. And again, for all of us, that may be different, and depending on where we are in life. If I'm a child or I'm in school, my job is to do my schoolwork. My job is to be obedient to my parents. If I'm the pastor of the church, I have some different responsibilities. But all of us have service. All of us have something that is the will of God for our lives. And so we're then, as we see in verse number 14, we're led by the Spirit of God. We're changed as we cooperate with His leading. And again, I, I like using it as a father and a son. As I would lead my son and I, as I would uh, think, okay, what is it? My, my boy is born today. What do I want him to know? What is most important to me that my son ever does? 
Well, for some people, it'll be that they're a race car driver or that they're the number one football player, that they're a basketball player. And I see in some of my schools and some of the summer camps that we run, I mean, these kids can, can hit a golf ball like a pro at, you know, this tall. And some of them can play basketball unbelievably well because they're driven, driven, driven to do that. When I held my son in my arms for the first time, I said, I want my son to know God and I want him to serve him all the days of his life. What does that look like? I don't know and I still don't know. At 13 years old, he's about right here right now. I still don't know God's will for his life. I know it is that he wants him to love him and to serve him all the days of his life. He wants him to spend time in church and in the Bible and to be a leader amongst people as a Christian. He wants him to stand above others. He wants him to have a relationship that allows him to stand out. And so how he lives that out or how that's fleshed out, what his job might be, I don't know those things. But I know that God wants him to be led by the Spirit because he's a child of God. And so we must cooperate with his leading. And the Apostle Paul says that the leading here of the Holy Spirit is the evidence of the salvation of the believer. If I'm led, then I'm a son of God. Because a father's not going to leave his son way back here. That a father's not going to leave his son behind. A, a true father, a, tr a father that loves his kid, is going to walk with him and he's going to teach him things. There's some things in my son, I, I like knives and I like my son to have a knife. And I, when they have a knife, we, we play with them, right? We go get them sharpened and we, we do different things with them because it's something that interests me and I want to pass that on to my kid. But as we're sitting there messing with our knives, we can have conversations. As we do different things around the church property, I can input into my kids. As we drive to the barber shop, I can talk to them about how their day went. And so I'm leading my kids. So the Holy Spirit wants to be able to do the same thing. He wants me every morning to wake up and spend some time with him. And throughout the day, he just wants me to hold his hand and walk with him. And as I do that, he's going to impart things to me. I don't want anything to happen tomorrow outside of my control. But God knows what things might have to happen outside my control tomorrow that will make me grab his hand a little bit harder and say, Daddy, right? Father, I need you. I need your help. Because otherwise, I just stick my hands in my pocket and I walk around like a spoiled little kid because life's good. Dad, take care of me. Sometimes God wants me just to hold his hand and squeeze a little bit tighter and say, Dad, I need you. And so he says, if you're led by the Holy Spirit, you're a son of God. And God's not going to let this little kid way behind it. And our world is messed up. So we see the evidence of fathers that don't do that. Paul's not teaching that again that the Spirit of God is uh, will lead some believer again with some mystical leading or that there's going to be stars or lights in the sky or you know some writing in the sky. Sometimes we wish that it wouldn't. But that's not how God works. He works through the Word of God. He works through prayer and fasting. He works through our relationship with Him. It's not going to be dreams or visions. It's going to be God speaking to our heart. Maybe through a message. Maybe through a fellow brother or sister in Christ. Most of the time it's going to be through the word of God. Our time. Our quiet time with God. That he speaks to us. Notice again verse number 14. We're coming through verse uh, chapter 8. Again verse number 9. If we're, he says that you are not in the flesh but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. He's saying if the Spirit of God is in you, you're saved. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not saved. In verse number 14, then the Spirit of God is going to lead you if He's in you and you're a son of God. And so this is in, in context of chapter 6 through 8. Look in chapter 6 quickly. Romans chapter 6 and look at verse number 3. We have a key word here, know. Chapter 6 and verse 6, knowing. Chapter 6 and verse 9, knowing. Chapter 6 and verse 11, reckon. Chapter 6, verse 13, yield. 6, 16, no. 6, 16, obey. So we got these key words, reckon, yield, know, and obey. So God wants us to reckon ourselves dead unto ourselves, reckon ourselves dead to the old man, that I am made new in Christ. He wants me to yield to the Spirit of God, to obey the Spirit of God, and to yield to His leading. And so He gives me these key words that I have to reckon myself dead to myself, yield to Him, reckon and obey, and he'll lead me. Notice in chapter number 7, again, it starts with, Know, know ye not, brethren. And so he's talking again to brethren. He's, he's leading us through this. And then throughout chapter 7, we see this ongoing battle between the two natures. Now I'm saved. I have Christ in my heart, but I still have the old man. I have the old nature. And it's a constant battle between them. And then I get into uh, chapter 8, and we see the ongoing battle, as we read, uh, between the flesh 
and, uh, and the spirit. And so the spirit and the flesh are constantly in this ongoing battle. And the spirit wants us to yield to him. He wants us to reckon ourselves dead to the old man, yield to him, obey his leading, and reckon ourselves again dead to those old things in my own ways. And so the Holy Spirit leads us into the scriptures, into understanding of the scriptures, and unto paths of righteousness. Psalm 23, verse 3 says, He restoreth my soul. He makes me new again. Why? For my good? For my purposes? Well, sometimes it's a blessing to me. But as verse 3 goes on, Psalm 23, 3, He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And we won't take time tonight to go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Last two weeks we've talked about that. There's three things there that we see that I would yield really to the word of God, that I would fulfill the will of God in my life. And he says, for the glory of God, and that he may glorify me in and through that. And so God wants to be glorified through my life, and through that he'll lift me up. He says he'll put me in a position when it's time. And so Psalm 23, 3 really reminds us of the same thing. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so any of the crowns, any of the, any of the trophies we might say that I'll win, and be able to take to heaven with me. It's, it's not because I did it. It's because I've yielded to the work of Christ in my life. The Holy Spirit's been able to use me and to mold me. And to make me what God wants me to be. And, and all those things are simply blessings. Because I've been faithful or allowed God to work in my life. So not only does he lead me in paths of righteousness. He also convicts me when I find myself intent on going my own way. And some of those times are, are wake up calls. Sometimes those are things that are hard to deal with. But it's no different than our kids. Sometimes my kids, I, I'll say something to them and they know they're wrong and they quickly say, yes, yes, sir, I, I understand I was, I was wrong. Then there's other times when you correct them and you get the full on fight. I wasn't wrong. I'll never be wrong. I will yield to you because you're my dad and I know if I don't, you're going to light me up. But I wasn't wrong. And deep down inside, they may not say that outward because they know what would happen too, but they inside, right? But don't we do the same thing? Right. When God blesses us, we're all happy. You know, we're so good, God's faithful. And then we do something, we find ourselves in sin, we know we're wrong. And God begins to put the, the claims down on us, and we begin to mumble and groan. And all God is doing is trying to restore that relationship, put us back in paths of righteousness for His name's sake and for our own good. And yet we murmur and complain about it. But God knows how to convict us, He knows how to get us back on the right path and we're going our own way. So those, the Bible says here, that experience the kind of spirit leadership in their lives, when they're away in sin or when they're doing right, when you find that leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life, you can know that you're a son of God. It's the work of God in your life. Notice again, verse number 9, that that is the evidence of salvation when we have the Holy Spirit and He's at work in our lives. The leadership of the Holy Spirit toward Christ's likeness takes place as we obey the Spirit of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18. Ephesians 5 and verse 18. Ephesians 5, 18, about says, speaking to yourselves in psalms, and I'm sorry, verse number 19 is verse 18, be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And so he's saying in, in Romans 8 that if the Spirit of God's at work in my life is evidence of my salvation. And if he is there, he's going to lead me. He wants me to follow him. He's going to begin this work of sanctification. So how does that work or how is it going to work best for me? He says by being filled with the Spirit of God. Well, let's notice three things about that. It, to be filled or controlled by the Spirit of God it means I'm controlled by an outside force or an outside person. Similar to how alcohol would control me. So number one tonight, to be filled is an imperative or it's a command. Notice he says there in that last phrase, but be filled with the Spirit of God. He doesn't give us a, it's not a question, it's not a, a you know, a, a decision we make. He just simply says, but be filled with the Spirit of God. So it's a command. And it's, it's somewhat of a shame, but God has to command us. To yield to the Holy Spirit's control because we're not automatically so inclined. It's my default position to do my own thing. I want to go my way. I want to do what pleases me. I want to do what pleases the flesh. So what got everybody in trouble since the garden, right? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and it moves us in the wrong direction. And so the Holy Spirit is telling us I must be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And it's a command because outside of Him commanding me to do it, I'm not going to do it. 
And so how do I learn to do it? Well, somebody preaches it to me and I realize there's a command there that I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, you know what? I don't know that I've been yielding to the Holy Spirit, so I need to work on that. And so I begin working on what's the Bible say about being filled with the Holy Spirit? How do I? Well, and we can get ourselves on the wrong direction with the charismatic and kind of so we're not careful. We can't attain any more filling with the Holy Spirit. At the moment of salvation, I'm filled with the Spirit. He indwells me, and I have as much of the Holy Spirit as I'm going to get at that moment. That change is not going to change. What changes is my following the Holy Spirit, my yielding to Him. Amen. And so he says, be filled with, in other words, be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Okay? And so I need to be fulfilled, and, uh, be, I'm sorry, be um, filled or be following, controlled by the Holy Spirit. So my natural tendency is to do my own thing. Number two tonight, it is, a, it is in the present tense. Notice that he says be filled with the Holy Spirit. It, it's a constant, ongoing thing. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell me, but as far as obeying Him or being controlled by Him is an ongoing, almost moment-by-moment, moment, step-by-step thing. Because I can wake up in the morning and I say, Good morning, Lord. Thank you for letting me live through the night. Thank you for another heartbeat and some more breath this morning. Thank you for a brand new day. And I walk out the door and the door slams shut and hits me in the elbow. I can find myself not being controlled by the Holy Spirit pretty quick, can I? Or it goes well. And so I walk across the parking lot and I look at the stars and I'm like, Oh, God, it's so good. Thank you so much. And then something else goes wrong, right? So within, within moments of waking up, and being in tune with God, I can find myself completely out of tune. And so it's a moment by moment. He says, be filled. Not only is it a command, it's a present tense, meaning it is almost a constant needing that I have. Therefore, I've got to keep my eyes on him. I've got to stay in tune with him throughout the day. I can't just take um, for granted that I am. Number three, it's also passive, which means it's an outside influence. It's something else that is doing it. And we would say it's someone else. And so he says there, be filled, uh, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. He simply, I think, uses that. Uh, we can teach with it, but it's also an example to us. But be filled with the Spirit of God. That outside influence from this person of God, from the person of this Holy Spirit of God, is going to influence me as the outward influence of an alcoholic beverage would begin to influence me. And so he's saying I need to yield to the Holy Spirit as something else would yield to me. Or would uh, cause that... that um, that, uh, that um, effect on my body or, or on my soul, on my, my spirit. And so I need to allow the Holy Spirit to do that and fill with the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is the one that empowers us as we yield to Him. He's that outward influence that begins to change us as we yield to the Word of God, as we obey the Word of God, and as we reckon ourselves dead to ourselves. And notice, go back to Romans 8, and, and again, we'll see that as we just read it uh, for what it says. Romans chapter 8. It's this supernatural work of the Holy Spirit of God. It says, There is therefore again, in verse number 1, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Our desire to be filled with the Spirit, our desire to be controlled by Him, and to walk in tune with Him, to simply grab Him by the hand and walk with Him through our day. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. So I have to understand that if I have the Spirit of God inside me, I'm free from those things. So when I find myself in sin, it's because I've made a choice. Not because I got stumped up or somebody pushed me into it. I made a choice to do it. I need to yield to the Spirit and not to the old man. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Whose flesh? Mine, yours, man's. We can't keep it. He says, for, the law, uh, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Because we have the Spirit of God living inside us, we can have victory over sin, we can have victory over the old man, we can have victory over our old sin nature, we can have victory over the flesh. And we can yield. We have opportunity to yield to the Holy Spirit. So again, the filling of the Spirit is a supernatural work of the Spirit of God. This is the process whereby the believer is enabled to become more like Christ. That's sanctification. And useful to the cause of Christ. That's service. Many believers, I believe, are virtually powerless to overcome the lust of the flesh and of the mind. 
because of a failure in this area. We never learn to yield to the Spirit of God. We never learn to reckon ourselves dead and obey the Spirit instead of our old man and the flesh. They may continue for years manifesting the same anger or angry spirit. They may be driven by the same pride. They're motivated by the same fears. They're crippled by the same hopelessness or consumed with the same lust that they've always been. How tragic for many years to forfeit the blessings and to be used by God because we never learn to yield to the Holy Spirit. If we just get into the Word of God and we begin to read it, we begin to understand we have the Spirit of God in us. He wants to lead us. We simply have to follow Him. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior tonight according to chapter 8? If you do, the Holy Spirit is inside you. Does the Holy Spirit dwell inside you tonight? Have you learned to yield to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to have control in your life? Has He maintained control or have you taken back control over some areas in your life? And this is the things we can think about and ask the Spirit of God to reveal to us tonight.